Hello, welcome everybody. I am Mark Medeiros, Community Engagement Manager at Peninsula Open Space Trust. And on behalf of POST, as well as our friends at USGS, we'd like to welcome you today to a presentation on the San Francisco garter snake. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the land and post working area has been home to many distinct communities of native people since time immemorial. We work to conserve and care for these lands, the ancestral territory of the Amamutsun, Muakmo Ohlone, Rameto Shalone, and Tamian Nation. These indigenous communities have survived centuries of displacement and are the past, present, and future caretakers of this land. So wherever you are, please pause to acknowledge the native people whose land you are on and consider how you can support them. And welcome to any native community members who are joining today. Um, for those of you who are new to POST, we always like to share a little bit. We're gonna show you this map of POST working area and all of our success over the years. Uh, we have protected over 80,000 acres of land in San Mateo, Santa Clara and Northern Santa Cruz counties. And this has been through the support of thousands of community members who donate to POST. And we do this in partnership with many public agencies and other nonprofits and other organizations. And our focus includes expanding public access so people can enjoy the many beautiful open spaces that we have nearby. Uh, we also focus on protecting redwood forests and farmland, but a huge area of our work is around wildlife conservation, habitat protection, wildlife connectivity, and other ways of supporting our local wildlife. And so we're going to be hearing about this beautiful local snake that many people don't know about, the San Francisco garter snake. And to help us with that conversation, we have two wonderful researchers, Elliot Shanig and Richard Kim from the Western Ecological Research Center at USGS. And uh, Richard and Elliot have been doing work on post-protected lands for many years, uh, focused on the SF garter snake. They're incredible experts on this species. Uh, first about Elliot, Elliot Shanig is a biology technician at USGS and an ecology master's student at UC Davis. He joined UC USGS in 2017 has worked on projects studying threatened and endangered reptiles and amphibians in California and Nevada, including the giant garter snake, western pond turtle, Dixie Valley toad, and San Francisco garter snake. Elliot, Elliot got his start working with San Francisco garter snakes nearly 10 years ago during his undergraduate at UC Santa Cruz and has been studying the species on post-managed land since 2018. Next. Uh, I'd like to describe Richard Kim. Richard Kim is a wildlife biologist at USGS and a PhD candidate at UC Davis. He joined USGS in 2012 and has worked on projects related to the conservation of threatened and endangered reptiles and amphibians in California, including the giant garter snake, San Francisco garter snake, and California red-legged frog. Richard finished his master's thesis at San Francisco State University, where he published a paper on predator-prey relationships between San Francisco garter snakes and invasive American bullfrogs, and how land managers might apply these findings to real-world conservation strategies from San Francisco for San Francisco garter snakes. For his PhD dissertation, he plans to develop conservation strategies for the threatened giant garter snakes through strategic controlling of invasive bullfrog populations. That's a whole lot of, um, of depth to their work. And you could see that these are wonderful people to tell us about the San Francisco garter snake. So with that, I'm gonna invite Elliot and Richard to the program. Hey there, how are you How's going? Hello. How's it going? Thanks for joining us today. Um, you're calling in from your office, where is that? It's in Dixon, California. Okay. We're a little, about an hour and a half, about an hour uh, up from the Bay Area. Okay. Well, great. So I'm sure others in the audience are similarly impressed in, 
with how much you focused on reptiles and amphibians and how specific and, and in depth your, your knowledge is. And I just thought to ask just real quickly, what inspired you to pursue this line of work? When I was a child, I grew up in a city. Uh, I grew up actually in a very po heavily densely populated city, uh, Seoul, South Korea. And despite living in a forest of skyscrapers, I think I always had that little, um, a kinder uh, that, that just stayed in my heart uh, about the love of nature. And this one day I remember seeing a tadpole metamorphose into a frog. And I just thought that was the coolest thing in the world. And I remember asking my parents, what do I have to do to study these guys when I grow up? Wow. I came at it uh, from a different side than Rich. I, uh, I also got hooked at a very young age, but it was due to spending a lot of time outdoors. Uh, and it just kind of it caught my first snake when I was really young. It was actually uh, coincidentally a garter snake uh, when I was a couple years old. And I just uh, same as Rich, just kind of been on a track to study snakes ever since then. That's amazing. I thank you both for for sharing that. You know, it's it's really cool, especially for any young people watching mm -hmm. to kind of hear how how folks have come to this work and all of our different experiences that have inspired us to, you know, focus on conservation and, and wildlife and, and nature. So um, I really appreciate both of you and the work that you're doing. And um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you to, to share your expertise on this beautiful snake. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Mark. All right. So. Uh, we would like to start by thanking the post for hosting this webinar and inviting us to present. And we also thank everyone, uh, viewers and um, those who will watch this recording uh, later on for attending. It, it's really a tre uh, pleasure to share about our research during these kind of public outreach. And before we begin, we would also like to thank all of our collaborators, coworkers, volunteers, uh, diligent field technicians who have been working in the field, collecting valuable data. Uh, we also want to thank the federal and state agencies, landowners, farmers, ranching tenants who all collaborate and cooperate with us uh, to allow all of our uh, research to occur on their lands. And we would like to make this webinar an interactive opportunity. So um, from time to time, we will pause, take some questions, uh, take a few questions, and then move on to uh, uh, the following topics. And we'll also have uh, more time to take any additional questions at the end of the presentation as well. Mm -hmm. We're pretty sure everyone uh, has their favorite animal or plant. Uh, our story begins when we were young scientists who just fell insanely in love with these beautiful snakes. The photo on the left is me. Uh, the first year that I started working for the USGS as a field technician and my very first time witnessing and handling uh, a San Francisco garter snake under my boss's supervision. It, it, it was such a heartwarming moment that I still remember to this day. And I had a similar really awesome experience handling my first San Francisco garter snake. As Mark said, I had uh, surveyed for San Francisco garter snakes for uh, a number of years before I started working with USGS, but was working on a project that just did visual searches and we weren't permitted to actually handle them. So on my first day out on a piece of post property, I walked up to one of the first ponds and I caught this beautiful 
a female snake back in 2018. And I picked a good first one to catch because she's become one of our most reliable snakes. Uh, and we've seen her every year since then. So what are these magnificent creatures? Uh, San Francisco garter snakes and hereafter SFGS are precinctive to the San Francisco Peninsula and its vicinity. And they're currently a, uh, identified as the subspecies of the common garter snake, Thamnophis sertalis. Now, ironically, they're, they're not common at all. They are critically endangered. And they're actually one of the first species in the U.S. that uh, were listed under the Endangered Species Act. So they were listed uh, endangered federally in 1967 and under the state in 1971. San Francisco garter snakes are really well known not only for their vibrant colors, but also due to their resistance to toxic prey. Uh, specifically the toxic Pacific newt species. They start as very, very small uh, neonatal snakes, almost thin and um, short like a fettuccine pasta noodle. But uh, as they grow up, they can grow up to be a meter long, but not always that long. So how did these beautiful snakes become endangered? In order to understand that, we first need to understand their natural history a little bit, uh, including their habitat needs, their dietary needs, and, and other life history traits. SFGS are very reliant on wetlands, uh, ponds, riparian habitat because most of their prey, their most important prey items are amphibians and occasionally fish. Here are some photos of SFGS consuming prey uh, in situ on site that we captured on camera. Uh, they generally prefer the Sierra, a smaller uh, Sierra and tree frog prey their, uh, the frog tadpoles, small metamorphs, and adults, and sometimes the uh, recently metamorphosed Pacific newts and the larval forms of the Pacific newts too. But as the snakes get larger, they are able to consume larger prey, uh, including metamorphosed and uh, large adult California red-legged frogs. Here's another irony. Um, California red-legged frogs are uh, threatened species, in fact. So we actually have an interesting circle of life where an endangered predator can forage on a threatened prey. What's just as important as these wetland habitats are the upland habitats. And by upland, we mean uh, grasslands with a bit of a mixture of shrub, mixed evergreens, sometimes a little bit of a coniferous forest. But the those areas that are uh, in the vicinity of the wetlands. And the reason why these areas are important is because snakes are ectothermic, meaning cold-blooded. Uh, they require this nice sunny habitat to keep their body warm, thermal regulate uh, before they start hunting for food. And after hunting for food, they need to digest. In the uplands, they can also find shelter uh, from predator during the day and also at night to sleep. Garter snakes frequently use uh, unabandoned rodent burrows. As, as shelter or uh, natural cover, such as any kind of complex vegetation structure, dead grass, uh, low shrub, that is pr pretty flush with the ground. And in winter, these uh, upland areas serve as important uh, hibernaculum during their brumation period until the next spring.
not only is the habitat itself, but also the seasons of the year uh, very important for SFGS. So spring and late summer, the reason why those two are the critical periods is the photos, I'm, the two photos I'm going to show you, this uh, winter, this photo taken in winter of a wetland and also in the late summer of uh, adjacent wetland. These areas where the water is a bit shallow, there is some emergent vegetation, uh, which provides really good sort of a 3D structure. It is perfect breeding ground for amphibians that are prey for the SFGS. And uh, this is an example of an egg mass that is laid by the threatened California red-legged frogs. They attach these egg masses to the vegetation. Egg masses of the Sierra and tree frogs. And during February, April, that's their the frog's main breeding period. Uh, the frogs would breed, tadpoles would hatch, and they would be uh, important prey, especially when snakes, juvenile snakes from the previous year, they are still not too large enough to consume adult red-legged frogs. Uh, this influx of Sierra and tree frog population is really important for them. Um, around April, that's when all the snakes uh, emerge from brumation too. So in order to find mate and reproduce, and uh, especially for females to gain a lot of biomass for healthy reproduction, this is a uh, important foraging period. And late in the summer, that is, that is when the second state second phase of uh, metamorphosis especially for the california red-legged frogs begin and that's another um, influx of prey availability for them brumation is slightly different than hibernation so to my understanding hibernation for example in mammals is when your system almost completely goes into the sleep mode, like, like in a computer, your, your system just almost completely shuts down except that your heart beats going um, to stay alive. Whereas brumation, snakes can sometimes emerge from their hibernacula during that period and still go uh, drink water if needed. So that, that potential to wake up in between, I believe that's that's the key difference. Is there? Yeah, I think brumation is just a, a less uh, intensive ver version of hibernation. And because the San Francisco garter snakes do occasionally uh, come out of their shelters mm. during winter, it's not a full hibernation. Mm. Great question. Yep. So now uh, we would like to share quick, uh, quick stats that show how important this availability of water is and that the reason why wetlands are so important because of that. We are going to show long-term data uh, we collected between 2007 and 2017 and we're going to show in this figure how recruitment of San Francisco garter snake has changed uh, from year to year. Recruitment in the simplest terms refer to how likely are uh, new snakes going to enter that population. So either from uh, moving in from a different area to that uh, specific population in an area or being born and being recruited to the population. So on the right in this table, we have 
uh, annual rainfall in uh, rainfall each year. Between 2006 and 2011, California had, I wouldn't say a wet year, but a relatively uh, uh, wetter year with more precipitation. And we, uh, the probability of recruitment, we see that compared to the, the next four years with much less rate rain, uh, onset of drought, the recruitment was much higher in those uh, wetter years. Another important information this these stats tell us is that long-term data is really important. Um, these types of population trends doesn't depend on a single or a couple of variables that can be easily uh, calculated. A lot of things come into play and only with long-term data can we parse these out. Okay, so we have a couple of questions. No, we'll get to those ones later. Okay, okay. Sorry. So uh, given their habitat and foraging requirements, we can really understand why their numbers have been declining throughout the historic range. Um, reduction and fragmentation of these suitable habitat, historic wetlands and riparian areas, they are, they're, one, they're one of the leading causes of SFGS decline because they not only lose their uh, habitat for themselves, but for their foraging ground, the amphibian prey also gets heavily impacted. Garter snakes are intermediate predators in the food web. So they do prey on a lot of, um, a lot of species underneath their trophic level, but they can also be prey for others. Uh, larger snakes, they are, although they have survived until that age, they, some, they can sometimes be seen with a lot of wounds. And Elliot, you wanna? Yeah, so this snake uh, here was one that we found that had a really crazy wound uh, that it sustained when it was a younger snake. But snakes are actually pretty resilient when it comes to injuries like this. And so even though it does have a pretty serious injury, it's been able to totally heal up right here. Um, and we actually see the belly scales come all the way up to the side. And this is probably sustained when it was a much younger snake. And I actually see in the chat that someone's asking about uh, turkey predation or effects on reptile and amphibian species now that they're overrunning the SF Peninsula. And uh, we don't have any direct data that suggests that turkeys pre prey on San Francisco garter mm. snakes, but I will say that we have noticed a few extra turkeys around one of our study sites in Pescadero. So uh, this uh, predator here was more likely to be a heron or uh, mm -hmm. raptor uh, of sorts, but um, they are really resilient and their main defense, as you can see on the right slide here, is that they will excrete a really foul smelling musk. And oftentimes when we pull them out of our snake traps, which we'll uh, get to in just a few slides, uh, they will release this musk. And if a predator picks them up, uh, that is their best way of kind of scaring off that predator by suggesting that they really don't taste very good. Mm. And they will occasionally bite. Uh, we get that question a lot about what it feels like, but they're pretty calm snakes, uh, and that's generally their last resort. And even when it happens, it just kind of feels like a little uh, pinprick. It's part of a job description. <laughs> <laughs> so we talked a little bit about predators. now. How do non-native invasive predators affect San Francisco, uh, SFGS? Now, to think about it, California and I guess worldwide, 
biological invasion is almost ubiquitous. Um, the world is no longer, no longer in pockets of habitat. There are introduced species, uh, introduced species everywhere in California. The most prominent invasive species that can affect SFGS are introduced introduce fish such as bluegill, bass, and importantly, bullfrogs. Bullfrogs are native to the east, eastern United States, but were uh, introduced to California in the early 1900s. The reason why bullfrogs are such interesting non-native species uh, for the for in the snake's perspective is on the one hand, these, on the one hand, the not, um, these bullfrogs and fish can be gluttonous predators of the amphibian prey or uh, SFGS, the especially invasive fish driving down populations of um, tadpoles, uh, larval forms of these native frogs, and bullfrogs also consuming uh, adult tree frogs and sometimes even uh, larger individuals of the red-legged frogs. So when we add bullfrogs to the predator-prey interaction between the native SFGS and the native frogs, we have a combination of positive and negative effects. So the arrows I'm showing in the figure is the direction of predation, where it's going. Uh, juvenile bullfrogs can be prey item for the snakes, but bullfrogs are direct predators of juvenile snakes and also their potential competitors. They can also display cannibalism, which is a very interesting population mm -hmm. dynamics. So in this mix of competition, predation, but uh, purpose as alternative prey, how do we cons how should we consider bullfrogs as as we're trying to plan an invasive species management? Are they beneficial to San Francisco snakes overall or not? So in order to uh, study this question for my master's thesis, we looked at, we investigated the diet patterns of each species. In other words, we were listening to both sides of the story. So for the bullfrog diet, uh, we, received some bullfrog carcasses from uh, a bullfrog culling activity that happened on our study site. And we um, opened up gut contents, looked at the uh, bullfrog's diet throughout, throughout each month. And in one of the frogs, we actually found remnants, uh, a, a tail piece, some vertebra, scales, bones of a San Francisco river snake. Listening to the snake side of the story was more challenging. They are uh, endangered species. So there are so many hoops and permits that you need to jump through in order to study their diet. Obviously you can't sacrifice them. Um, conventional ways of looking at snake diet is palpating a snake to uh, encourage them to regurgitate their meal, but that's stressful for this, that can be stressful for the snake. And it was no longer permitted by Fish and Wildlife Service on the, on the year that I started my master's project. But grad students are pretty resilient and they, they cease to stop. So we decided to look at the diet through the other end. So we used fecal DNA from SFGS that we sampled during the mark recapture study and performed genetic analyses 
on that fecal DNA. So for, I guess many of us have heard the term, one person's trash might be another person's treasure. So literally the snake fecal samples were liquid gold to my study. Uh, each, each pellet was a, a, a data point, datum point. So we would uh, collect snake fe feces, extract DNA in the lab. And after that, um, perform what's called a PCR, polymerase chain reaction. And we would run the results and try to find the presence of prey DNA. So in the photo on the right, what we're showing is an example snapshot of how we detect whether a prey item was eaten. On the far left side, we have template DNA of uh, prey species that we're interested in, whether it occurs or not in that fecal sample. And the five uh, shining bars on the right of that positive control, that is the samples that uh, if there is target prey DNA, so in this particular sample, I was testing for DNA of the threatened California red-legged frogs and aligning, uh, align, aligned, aligned markers. This, this shows that yes, this individual 1055 has indeed consumed uh, the red-legged frogs. So that's, that's how I collected the diet data. Now, if we have any parents in the audience, uh, one day your child might come home and tell you that they want to study fecal samples for their grad study. Uh, and please don't be alarmed. I turned out okay, so, or at least until now. <laughs> so uh, from that compiled diet data, we found out that competition for the shared tree frogs, that was the main negative effect of bullfrogs on San Francisco virus snakes. Uh, to be clear, this was a site-specific analysis. So of course, this doesn't uh, represent the entire uh, San Francisco garter snake species throughout multiple areas, but at least in uh, some localities, this will be a plausible conclusion. So given this harmful effect, a uh, strong effect of competition, we also assessed uh, whether their recruitment of, of new garter snakes were affected when the bullfrogs were culled from the site. And the result we found was indeed there was higher recruitment of uh, new snakes in our population. The figure here on the x-axis, I'm showing the uh, bullfrog abundance. And on the y-axis, I'm showing the probability that uh, new probability that uh, snakes will be recruited to the population. And the solid line shows the sh shows the um, the mean probability across different estimated mean probability of recruitment across different uh, abundance level of bullfrogs throughout the y-axis. So a declining line means that the more bull declining line means that uh, the less bullfrogs there are in the system, the higher the chance of recruitment. So next, we're going to move on to the mainstream, sort of the core uh, methods and, and data analyses in our, in our Dixon station. And before we jump to that topic, maybe we can uh, pause a little bit to take some questions. Yeah, I've been looking at the chat and I see uh, I see a couple questions that I think we are going to uh, get to. 
uh, in the next section that we go over. But one that I will uh, answer right now uh, relates to the range of the San Francisco garter snake and specifically whether they're present in the East Bay. We actually only find the San Francisco garter snake subspecies on the San Francisco Peninsula, uh, in, mostly in San Mateo County. Uh, but there's a similar snake, uh, another subspecies of common garter snake called the uh, red-sided garter snake that occurs in the East Bay. And it's not quite as vibrant, but they definitely occur out at Sunol and you might be seeing those out there. A um, couple questions about our uh, marking procedures that we're gonna get to in just a minute. So uh, we'll answer those shortly. Sounds great. So, uh, long-term population study. We're actually going to mention it uh, many times throughout our presentation. Why is it so important? When we're trying to save imperiled species, we need to understand so many things. Uh, what they need as resources, where they're distributed, how their survival, recoup so how their demography is, their population genetics, what impacts they may receive from anthropogenic uh, development or introduction of non-native species. And with those baseline information, we can predict, simulate, and sometimes um, apply in field settings different methods to mitigate that population decline and hopefully increase their abundance and distribution in the long run. So our, our team under PI Dr. Brian Halstead, what we do at USGS Dixon office mo mostly focuses on laying that foundational work, the long-term demographic study. And this includes topics like observing trends in in, this, in different snake population over time, survival, recruitment, and based on that, projected population growth rate. And especially with longer term data, we can explore various uh, possible variables that can affect those demographic trends. And the longer the time series data, the more likely we'll be able to parse things out. And I wanted to share some examples of how our station's research has moved on. So in 2011, uh, led, lead authored by our PI, Dr. Halstead, USGS published the first long-term demographic study on San Francisco garter snakes. And as soon as that uh, paper and that sampling effort sort of kick-started, kick-started the long-term study, we were able to move on to different projects that branched off from the mark recapture study, uh, assessing effects of prescribed fire on San Francisco garter snakes. Um, another lead researcher at a different USGS station was able to look at uh, population genetics of uh, different garter snakes uh, throughout throughout the throughout the vicinity of the Bay Area region, uh, including some DNA samples from San Francisco garter snakes. I was personally able to finish my master's project uh, working on the San Francisco garter snakes as a branch of the mark recapture project in, uh, in the, uh, assessing the effects of invasive species. And as we'll discuss a little later, this will also uh, progress us further to, to future research on long-term demographics and uh, another interesting topic that Elliot will tell you more about. So Rich talked uh, a bit about the ecology of the San Francisco garter snakes and how they fit into the food web relating to some of the other uh, amphibian species in San Mateo County. Uh, but he also highlighted the importance of having long-term data on uh, rare species. 
And it's really important because we return to a lot of these sites year after year and we catch the same snakes again and again. And it's really critical data to see which ones survive, which ones are uh, still moving around and how much they've grown. And to do so, we have a couple different ways that we actively catch San Francisco garter snakes. And when we do catch them, we do a couple different things. I'm gonna highlight the capture methods uh, in the next slide. But once we've got a snake in our hand, like Patrick Lehan, uh, one of our long-term field techs and biologists uh, has in this picture here, he's pulling a San Francisco garter snake out of one of our funnel traps. Uh, the first thing we do is mark it with a, a unique micro brand. And you can see on the right side of the screen here, we have these tiny little utensils that are, uh, are actually originally designed for eye surgery. And they create just a, a hot little coil that we barely touch down to the surface of the snake's skin. And we give it a unique mark. And that mark will last for the snake's entire life. And so every snake has uh, a unique number, just like that snake that I caught on my first day, good old uh, 507. We see her every year and we can turn her over and read that brand mark uh, and get an idea of which snake it is. And uh, we also see Rich in the top corner here weighing the snake uh, to get its mass. And then Patrick uh, measuring the snake's length. We measure the body and tail length. And we also determine what its sex is. Uh, we take photos of kind of unique patterns and then we kind of turn the snake loose and hopefully we'll catch it again the next year. Um, so it's a uh, fairly short processing that we do, uh, but the data we get from recapturing a snake is really critical. Um, and so to actually catch the snakes, we mainly utilize drift fences with funnel traps. And you can see a nice drift fence along the edge of one of our ponds at a post property here. And the snake is just kind of crawling along. It, encounters the drift fence, and even though it could likely crawl over the top, snakes are really like to take the path of least resistance. And so they generally just move left or right all the way to the end where they encounter one of these uh, funnel traps. And you can see a couple nice examples of funnel traps that did their job on a given day and caught a couple San Francisco garter snakes. Uh, we don't normally end up with two snakes or three snakes in every trap, but it's pretty nice to see. Uh, and we also utilize cover objects like tin and wood cover boards that kind of imitate the snake's natural habitat that they like to use uh, for basking and shelter. And so we put out these pieces of tin. Uh, it's kind of like littering, but we do it in a scientific way and make sure we have permission. And uh, we end up turning the tin over, and if the temperatures are right, we'll find a, a snake like we do in the bottom right corner here under them. And a lot of folks ask if we bait the traps with anything. The traps are just passive, so they're capturing snakes as they cruise across the landscape. But occasionally, we get a little bit of a helping hand from a female snake. Uh, these are coast garter snakes here, and this trap got occupied by one or two adult female coast garter snakes that must have been laying down a uh, trail of pheromones and were ready to mate. And as a result, instead of just two females, we ended up with two females and around 10 males. Uh, so sometimes the traps end up baiting themselves like this. And I'm a terrible artist, but I did uh, have some free time one day and I drew a bad imitation of a San Francisco garter snake on top of this trap. It turned out to be one of our most productive traps. So here's a view of kind of walking up to the trap and opening it up. And you can see great day. We got three San Francisco garter snakes in there. We also have a, a wet sponge in there uh, in case we capture any amphibians to give them a nice uh, water source to stay cool. And I'm just going to add that three San Francisco garter snakes in a trap in a day that that That's, never happens. That doesn't happen too often. Mm -hmm. So I like to think uh, they could, they really recognize my artistic prowess there. 
Um, somebody asked in the chat about their patterning and why they evolved to have such bright red coloration compared to other garter snakes. Uh, when you see it against a uh, solid background, especially in good lighting, the red and the turquoise coloration really sticks out. But if you look onto the right side of the screen here, this is what a predator or a person might see if they were walking along a trail and encountered a San Francisco garter snake. There's a lot of interesting reddish colorations, plants like blackberries and other weeds, uh, smart weed, that really do provide kind of a good background coloration. The red is still, it's a little bit gaudy, but it does uh, give them a good camouflage. So this is uh, another way we capture snakes is occasionally we just manage to spot them out basking. And the snake's just kind of right in the middle of the frame there. But that red coloration doesn't jump out quite as much as you'd think it would. It, it does provide some level of camouflage. And uh, recently for a new project we've been working on, we've also been ultrasounding gravid snakes. Gravid is a, a term that refers to uh, snakes that give, or animals that lay eggs as their form of reproduction. And snakes have a unique way. Some snakes lay eggs and others uh, have almost internal eggs that stay inside them. So a lot of people will say pregnant, we still will refer to them as gravid snakes. But when we get a gravid female, we carry this portable ultrasound that you can see on the right side of the screen here. Uh, and we kind of gently stretch the snake out and it gives us a look right into the inside of the snake here. And we can see this really round embryo and it stands out pretty well if you get the ultrasound positioned well. And as we run the ultrasound wand along the bottom of the snake, we get a good view of all of the embryos back to back. And without doing anything invasive, we can actually count how many embryos that snake has, uh, which is gonna be really critical for some projects relating to their reproduction that we work on. Uh, and it gives us an exact count without harming them at all. And so that's work that's all done by uh, Rich, myself, Patrick, and some of our other technicians I saw uh, Sean Parnell, one of our past technicians in the chat. Hey, Sean, how's it going? Um, so we've had, as Rich mentioned at the beginning, we've had a whole network of folks that have been really crucial for collecting all this data. And the result is at uh, a couple of these post-managed sites, we have data for over 10 years where we went back out to the spot every single year. And it's really important, this bar chart here just shows raw data, so the total snakes we captured each year. So the abundance or the actual estimated population is different, but you can see that there's pretty serious fluctuations. And some of that's due to the amount of effort we spent, but a lot of that is due, like Rich was saying, to responses to drought, responses to predators, prey. And so if you just go out one time, you get a just a snap, snapshot mm -hmm. of their population. And so by returning again and again, we really get this long-term look at what the population's doing. Uh, and at one of the properties that we've looked at that's managed by post, we have seen kind of a constant fluctuation, but overall it's doing pretty well. And before we move on, I think there was a really interesting question that sort of segues uh, into fr from this. So has climate change mm. caused a noticeable ongoing shift in demographic and or geographic data of the SFGS? That is an excellent question. So the, I guess there's no short answer for this. Uh, we did collect data at this long-term study site and a shorter term, so four years, so that is three uh, intervals that Four, uh, three intervals between the four years that we can estimate um, survival, recruitment, and population growth from. We are so uh, led by led by another USGS scientist, um, and I'm actually going to dis um, discuss about the new paper. I think in the next. Oh no! Oops, sorry. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
uh, about the ongoing ongoing manuscript in prep a little bit later. But to give a little bit of a sneak peek, we were doing preliminary analyses to uh, see whether we can understand there are site-wide site-wide differences in the uh, effect of environmental variables on those demographics and so far with the with just the four so three uh, intervals of years of data it wasn't easy to parse out now we will probably have a better information and a better answer to that uh, as we as we complete the manuscript but that is an excellent question so I got ahead of myself jumping slides. Uh, we also do capture a number of other snake species and a lot of people like to see what other snakes coexist with the San Francisco garter snakes. Uh, we see two other garter snake species. This is the coast garter snake and the aquatic garter snake. Uh, this is a yellow bellied racer. Uh, we have gopher snakes, uh, ring neck snakes down here that have a really bright colored belly. Uh, we have the rubber boa, which is a uh, relative of the tropical boas. It's the northernmost boa. And we occasionally catch rattlesnakes too. And we uh, have this great opportunity since we're out trapping that we are able to capture data on all of these different snakes. And so even though our main target is San Francisco garter snakes, we have accumulated a really big data set on all different species. So that was sort of our ongoing and the research up until the present day. Uh, we wanted to share a little bit more about the great, uh, the e exciting manuscripts and projects that we plan to uh, pump out in the future. So the first one, uh, as I mentioned, Dr. Jonathan Rose in our team and our PI, Dr. Brian Halstead, they're leading uh, and Elliot and I are included in the project as well. We are um, using data all the way from 2007 up until 2020, and we are trying to develop a really data intensive, data driven population model that can ultimately inform specific target size classes of SFGS that we can focus management efforts on. So this is sort of the, the piece de resistance of all that effort that we've been putting into these years. Um, in order to use this demographic information to real world management, in order to make that uh, connection, it is effective if we can have tractable goals. For one is targeting specific life stage or size class of target animals that we can focus uh, protection on. So using these models, in a nutshell, will inform us which category, which size class, which stage of a, a species is the most vulnerable to, to disturbances. So that's the beauty of this, uh, th this kind of work. Uh, additionally, uh, as Mark mentioned, I'm a grad student at UC Davis, and I'm looking at how we can better utilize using those cover boards and tin objects to sample for San Francisco garter snakes at sites where they haven't been uh, surveyed for in quite a while. The traps are really useful for these long-term studies, but they're really hard to carry out to remote locations. And so I'm hopefully gonna be utilizing those cover boards to get a better idea of whether there are still garter snakes at some of these additional spots. We also have interest in looking at some of the long-term benefits of grazing, uh, some of the post properties and pond management. We'll show a couple pond management pictures in a couple slides. Uh, and looking at how the different grazing schedules and uh, cattle fencing projects that have happened have affected the snakes. 
And then I mentioned we have this huge data set now of trends in abundance data and life history data and measurements on all of these more common species. Even though those may not be in conservation risk now, uh, it's still really useful to look at snake populations and monitor them. And so that could be really useful uh, to look at in the future. So we wanted to sort of give one of the take home messages. The real, the reason why we spend so much effort and time on this is in order to reach that tractable management goal, we need, uh, uh, in order to apply uh, management in field, we need those tractable goals. And in order to compile all that, the foundational information is the demographics, uh, habitat needs, uh, diet studies. So these basic um, foundation is very important. How do we really work together in all this? So researchers and stakeholders truly appreciate cooperation of uh, landowners, farmers, ranchers. And it's interesting, the kindergarten really teaches us everything that we need to learn in life. Um, we've always been taught sharing is good. And that's exactly what we're trying to do with, with the stakeholders, the public, and um, ranchers, landowners. So organizations like uh, Peninsula Open Space Trust, Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District, they have uh, they build amazing connection with the uh, with the ranching tenants, the the farming tenants, the researchers, and sort of being a good uh, bridge that connect all of us to co-use the land, promote sharing the land so that research and agricultural practices can co-occur. And one of those co-occurring uh, projects that has happened is this pond restoration at post sites. Uh, as Rich mentioned earlier, the hydro period is really important uh, for the recruitment of amphibians and the successful uh, uh, life cycle that they undergo where they start their lives in these ponds. And so a couple of the more fragile and critical pieces of habitat have had really successful projects done to give them better habitat for amphibians and snakes. And so uh, these ponds here have really sensitive habitat and we've uh, had a project where we fenced off areas around post put in fences to keep the cattle out of just the most critical zones uh, and give buffers for the snakes and also dug out the ponds a little bit to create a longer uh, hydro period. So give the tadpoles more time to metamorphosize. Uh, a little bit of reduced disturbance from the livestock and the result uh, is much more emergent vegetation along the ponds. And uh, as a result of that, we got the return of a lot more amphibian prey for the San Francisco garter snakes, including uh, those threatened red-legged frogs that we've talked about. Here's another pond example. This pond was dug out so that it maintained water for long enough for those amphibians to uh, undergo metamorphosis. And uh, a third pond you can see on the left here, this is at a site where uh, National Park Service actually recruited public to help with the restoration. And the general public are so valuable to ongoing conservation efforts, uh, really play an invaluable role for everything that's going on here. Uh, volunteering uh, on restoration projects like this uh, in citizen science projects such as bio blitzes is really crucial uh, for researchers and posts offers so many good volunteer opportunities. So if you're ever interested in any of those, uh, take them up on it. And it really is crucial for our research and the ongoing land protection. And I saw somebody ask earlier in the chat if, if poaching, I think, was a problem for these snakes. And another person asking 
uh, where exactly they could go to see a San Francisco garter snake. Unfortunately, we don't divulge specific locations for where we do our research because poaching has been a problem for San Francisco garter snakes in the past. And we also say another uh, role that public can play is if you are out on these uh, land management properties, if you see people that don't look like they're supposed to be there uh, messing with biological study sites, please uh, let somebody know because it does occasionally happen and uh, it detracts from our ability to do research and from the snake's ability to recover. So as a result, uh, the closest I'll get to suggesting a location to see these snakes is uh, go hiking along the coast in San Mateo County. Uh, as Rich said, they love wetland areas. And if you spend enough time out there, uh, you, should, you should come across one eventually. One of our main take home messages, in addition to sharing our research finding, is the importance of collaboration between all bodies of of everyone. So in order for there to be great conservation outcomes, there has to be a fluid connection between the researchers, stakeholders, the public, and land landowners, management, um, and organizations like Post and MidPen, they provide invaluable roles in that. Uh, stakeholders, by understanding our re research needs and permitting these processes, make the administrative work flow smoothly. And we get to do the fun, dirty work, getting muds on our hands and also providing valuable information. And last but not least, this is probably the most important, the important role of the public. Unless we science can be great but it can be greater if we can communicate better with the public and we can really deliver the the message so being aware being involved being enlightened uh for everyone to join in live stream like this today and having more interest in conservation and san francisco garden snakes it is extremely valuable and we appreciate it and um, and when I speak this, I speak for everyone in the USGS that we will continue to do our part in monitoring these listed species, uh, such as SFGS. And we take great value in properties where uh, these long-term studies can happen. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. And I think we'll uh, transition to any questions that we didn't get to uh, during our presentation. Mark, do you have any that are uh, at the top of your list? Yeah, well, first I want to say thank you, Richard and Elliot. Um, we are very lucky to have you doing this work and so passionate um, about it. It's, it's just so cool. I, I love hearing folk about folks who are just really into the weeds on one of these specific um, issues that we have. There are so many different um, species and considerations around conservation in our area. Um, so there are a couple of questions I thought we could get to, but I wanted to reiterate a couple of the points that you made. Definitely. Um, <clears throat> just some, some perspective uh, from post, you know, this issue or this theme around um, reconciling different needs um, and, and priorities. Um, that example of um, working with farmers and ranchers and working to not only you know, ensure they could continue their, their work in producing food, but also in a way that's compatible with the environmental needs of the environment that they're working in. And this is a theme that cuts across a lot of post projects. And um, it's really cool to hear, you know, the, the collaboration that's going on around uh, pond habitats and, and making sure that ranching and pond habitats are compatible. And it's a, mis, um, 
it's a misperception sometimes um, in terms of farming and ranching being not compatible with conservation. There's many ways where we can re reconcile those those different um, needs, um, community needs and environmental needs. So that was one thing. And then I just want to reiterate that point about, you know, um, folks wondering where they could go out and see these. And you all did a wonderful job of um, illustrating some, you know, general uh, geography of where these uh, snakes exist and um, some of the projects that you're doing, but then not giving away specific locations and you do that for a specific reason is because we have to be sensitive about, um, you know, the specific locations where these snakes are because they are endangered. Um, so that's something that we, we often do is just um, consider how much we share about the location of, a, of an endangered animal um, like this. So, so yeah, um, just maybe we'll, um, we'll see if we, there's any questions that we, we missed here, or just one or two, since we are a little bit um, over time. Um, I do see a question that I might be able to answer. So there was a question, uh, how do you feel about leaving bullfrog where California red-legged frogs have been extirpated or, and uh, if we reintroduce California red-legged frogs? That's a very great, interesting question. And I would say in order to address that question, a modeling sort of a community modeling uh, approach as like the foundational step would be helpful. What I mean by that is uh, in my study system for my uh, master's work, California red-legged frogs and bullfrogs did co-occur uh, with the snakes. So I did not have a chance to evaluate the diet patterns of SFGS where bullfrogs were the only uh, ranid prey for, for the snakes. So in order to, uh, because there are logistic difficulties to just get multiple field sites and it would require a lot of grad students <laughs> to do <laughs> things like that. So a modeling, so something like a modeling study for that would be uh, a good simul, it can provide good simulations of the possible scenarios of, uh, of what would, what could happen if one, SFGS are, uh, they have adapted to readily consume bullfrogs at, at those sites or not? And how would management uh, have to be nuanced based on different scenarios? So that's a modeling study as a beginning would be great. Sorry, that was a long answer. <laughs> I just, again, just appreciate how much um, consideration needs to go into the minutia of, of these interactions between um, various species and, and different age classes and all, all these different specifics that you you shared. Um, uh, I think I'm just gonna ask this one um, really quick and we're gonna conclude since we're over time here and you've um, both done such an excellent job of answering questions along the way. And the, the question's about volunteering um, specifically. Um, so, uh, before asking you two, if there are any opportunities for folks to um, volunteer around snake research, uh, I just want to share in general volunteering around uh, habitat restoration and studies. As Rich and, and Elliot shared, you could look at Post's website uh, for volunteer opportunities, but I'd also recommend checking out uh, Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District, their volunteer website, the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority. Um, there's some great nonprofits in the area, including Grassroots Ecology and the San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory that do habitat restoration. So um, 
various opportunities in general out there to support habitat restoration. Uh, there may or may not be opportunity around snake research or habitat restoration. Is there anything that you two know of? We, uh, unfortunately, during during COVID for the past year and a half, our office hasn't had any volunteers for any of our projects. Um, prior to that, we would very occasionally have volunteers come out with us on our San Francisco garter snake research uh, field days, but it is a pretty uh, strict protocol and it's, mm. it's not super easy for us to get the clearance, unfortunately. But as you highlighted, the best way to volunteer to help uh, these snakes is with restoration efforts. And uh, in addition to helping with habitat restoration, volunteer days like those also get you into really cool places. And uh, if you're looking for a chance to see a San Francisco garter snake, the best way would be to volunteer with restoration at a wetland where they occur. So, um, uh, oftentimes you'll just see one crawling around when you're planting plants or something like that. So I would say uh, the sites you mentioned are probably the best avenue for that. Um, That's great. And um, and so with that, I'm just going to say thank you one more time. There's been so much uh, thanks and praise in chat. Um, so I hope you all, um, you both have a nice weekend, Richard and Elliot. And thank one you. more yeah, and one more time, I'm, let's share the Western Ecological Research Center at USGS website for everybody if you'd like to check out this work um, in a little bit more depth. And um, with that, I'm going to say goodbye. Thank you again to both of you. Thank you, and thank thanks you. to everyone that came. Thank you, everyone. All right, have a good weekend, everybody.